Hi there everybody, thank you for tuning in again. You're here for another episode of Vulcan Knowledge. I'm very happy today to be joined by Dr. Natasha Dowie, who is a geoscientist, volcanologist, a lecturer in physical geography, and she's involved in a whole number of projects I'm really excited to talk about today. Hi Natasha, thanks for joining us. Hi Sam, thank you for having me. Absolutely no problem. Um, like I said, there was a, quite a long list of titles <laughs> I gave you there, and I think it's uh, I think it's nice to show you know the, the breadth of some of the things that that we do. But I'd be really interested to hear a bit about your journey because you've come in and out of um, doing research in volcanology over the years. Yeah, so I've had a an unusual career path for an academic, um, and I guess I've seen both sides of the fence. Um, I've worked in academia and I've worked in industry. Um, I started off at Aberystwyth um, doing an undergraduate in environmental earth science. And I only went to Aberystwyth because I wanted to be by the coast because I'm Cornish. So <laughs> the idea of going anywhere far from the sea just was very upsetting to me. It was, it was somewhat familiar. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, and, and then I did, uh, I stayed on at Aberystwyth and did a master's. Um, I was really... Uh, passionate about volcanoes um, from quite a young age and that's why I did environmental earth science and then um, I had the opportunity to stay on and um, did some work looking at the chemistry of Santorini volcanic rocks which was very exciting um, and then I had a year out and I did a lot of traveling uh, which was a brilliant decision and which I would always recommend to any young person to go and try and Whatever is within your powers, which whatever's within your finances, within your reach, try and take some time, try and do a gap year, try and do a study abroad, anything that's possible. Apply for funding if you can. Um, <laughs> Were there volcanoes along the way? Well, actually, yes, because I did travel to New Zealand. So I did get uh, to see yes. some lovely New Zealand volcanics. I got to smell the rotten eggs of Rotorua. And you haven't lived as a volcanologist until you've been in that smell for at least a few days. <laughs> and it um, lingers on the clothes for several days. And it afterwards. does. It does a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. And um, and then I came back and I worked for a year temping in actually in media, in marketing and promotions for a newspaper company in Cornwall, which is another kind of random, random point on my career trajectory. And I did that while I was applying to PhDs. And the reason that I applied to PhDs was actually a really rubbish reason. It was, it's not the reason that I would recommend anyone to apply for a PhD. It was simply because I still didn't know what to do with my life. Um, I thought that going traveling would solve all the, all the problems in my mind about what I was going to do. Turned out I didn't. And when I got back, I just couldn't see any jobs that were enough volcanoes involved. So I set out to find myself a PhD. And then I ended up doing a PhD at Liverpool. Um, on Tenerife, so a lot of field work in the caldera at Tenerife, which oh, is an amazing experience. Yeah. And then I finished my PhD. I applied to some postdocs and got nowhere. Um, applied to, I think, some funding opportunities. I think I applied to go on the deep ocean drilling program. And I just kept on getting rejections and I just didn't really know what to do. And in the end, I just took a punt and started applying for some industry jobs. And back then, geologists were getting employed in the oil industry. And it's something that I never thought I would do. It's mm. a company, an industry that I never thought I would go into. And to be honest, I didn't really feel like I had much of a choice. And I, I happened to go to an interview at this amazing little consultancy who was, it was just full of really great people and they completely swayed me. And... At that interview, I understood how my experience in volcanic stratigraphy, which is what I had studied, I had studied how the layers of volcanic sediments that are laid down during an eruption tell us a story about that eruption. By going to this interview, I understood that that transferable knowledge of understanding stratigraphy and what it can tell us about stories and the planet's history was actually really useful in industry. And that was something that I hadn't had a previous idea of. Yeah, I guess, so, yeah. I guess it's always an important thing to know that it's it's not necessarily the things that we work on or the specific areas, but it's those skills that we acquire along the way. That yeah, we, and, for sure. And it's, sometimes it takes someone else to make you recognize where, where those are applicable and in what yeah. way. And as you say, you can directly translate so much of the things you did from field work to data analysis to 
writing reports and papers, all of those skills are transferable. Yeah. And, you know, working in industry gave me a huge amount of transferable skills. It gave me the opportunity to travel with business. It gave me the opportunity to take more field training and also to lead field training. I was a trainer on the internal kind of graduate program. And I just gained a whole bucket load of experience. And I, and I didn't really understand how business and industry worked when I first joined mm-hmm. industry. And I gained a lot of insight into the real world, really, which is something that sometimes academia is very effective at shielding you from. <laughs> um, so it was a really valuable experience. Um, but over time, working for the oil industry, as I kind of always expected it would, I I didn't believe in it. I didn't believe in who I was working for and what I was working for. And although I understand that the oil industry has done a lot for society in the past, for me, the way that the world is and the way that the world is changing and the issues that the oil industry has contributed to were all just too much for me to continue working in it personally. And I say that carefully because I've got a number of colleagues who do work in the oil industry Mm. still, and I don't think they're all bad people. Um, But personally, for me, it wasn't the right choice. So I started to look for jobs back in academia, plunged back the other way. Yeah. So as you say, it's it's an interesting line for us to tread when it comes to these things, because it is so valuable to have that you know, that insight into the way the industry works. And it is it is evolving over over time in, in some areas and in, and in different areas. Um, but from your perspective as well, did it give you, a, as you say, that, that understanding of, you know, what's happening in the real world, that interaction between, you know, geoscience and social science, was that quite yeah. an important part of it as well? For sure, for sure. And there were a couple of things about working in industry that I really struggled with early on. So I struggled with the fact that, we were working on the geology, but because everything's so siloed in industry, we never really had any influence over what was actually happening on the ground. It's such a massive industry, you know, so we were working on the real kind of blue skies, geological exploration, but I was never able to think about those people who were actually affected by exploration. And that that uh, kind of distinction was I really struggled with. Mm. And also... Things were going on in society that were really difficult to ignore. I remember a real turning point for me. There were a couple of big turning points for me. One was when the little consultancy that I worked for got bought out by a very much bigger company and the values and things changed, which is natural when, you know, mergers Mm -hmm. and acquisitions happen. But also the 2015 IPCC report came out. And for me, that was eye opening in really making me understand what was happening with the world. Um, And I should have been more educated. I should have understood more, I think, but I didn't. Um, And that report was really seminal in really changing my perspective on what I did and really making me want to move to something much more sustainable and to, again, shift my skill set to a different area. I guess I had that confidence because I'd already done it once. Yes. I felt like, okay, well, I've got these skills. I can just... I could just apply them somewhere else, but it wasn't easy. It was a hard process. And I applied for a lot of jobs before I eventually shifted on and went somewhere else. But now you are back working in the field of volcanology. (laughs) Yeah. So I was very fortunate and was able to get a role at the University of Hull, um, where one of my um, heroes in volcanology, Dr. Rebecca Williams, works. And she's been a real mentor. Um, We were both actually weirdly, we have quite an incestuous supervisory thing going on with (laughs) our PhDs where my PhD supervisor supervised her PhD supervisor. So we had kind of come into contact previously during our PhDs and at conferences. And we have very similar research interests. So when um, I started working there, we were able to put our heads together and come up with some really exciting ideas. Um, And also working with Dr. Pete Rowley, who's another collaborator, who, again, has a kind of tied in supervisory connection to us. Everybody. It's a very small community, particularly when you're working in a a niche within a niche. (laughs) It really is. And we're particularly niched. Um, (laughs) So, yeah, I had found this little niche um, again. And, you know, I'm really grateful to those guys for being so patient with me and uh, for really aiding my transition back to academia, really. Yeah. Um, but I was very fortunate to get that role. It was a temporary job 
And it involved a really big upheaval for my family. Um, it was scary to leave a permanent stable job mm. to go back to an industry that is inherently unstable with temporary contracts. I had two kids when I did it and it involved moving my family to a different town. Um, yeah, it was a scary decision to make, but I am grateful every day that I made it. Yes. Uh, and so you said that, you know, you, you were then working alongside Rebecca and then uh, uh, you and Rebecca are part of a, a group called uh, Voices, um, yeah. which is a really, really fantastic network. I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about this network that you've had. How, how long has it been going now? Yeah, so um, I think it's only been up and running for a year or just over a year. But some of the people involved in it have been doing research in this area for years. So um, Rebecca supervises Jasmine Scarlett um, and Jasmine's work during her PhD on basically social volcanology, cultural volcanology um, and decolonization, colonization and volcanology, those kinds of themes. So Jasmine and Rebecca have been working on that for a good few years on Jasmine's PhD before I um, started at Hull. And also researchers who've been at Bristol, people like mm -hmm. Elsa Naismith and Emily Aspinall, um, Rianne Mira from Swansea. So there's a group of volcanologists who either through unfunded means or through funded means at various points have been working on questions around not just the physical science of volcanology, but how volcanoes interact with society and how different societies behave when volcanic eruptions happen and how cultural and political and social situations influence disaster risk reduction, basically. It's something that we're all really interested in. Yeah, it's, it's, it's that side of volcanology that, you know, say, as someone looking in front of the general public, you might not necessarily associate that as part of the science. When someone hears the word, hears the word volcanologist, they imagine that person rappelling down into the lava lake in a big silver boiler suit um, or walking around the ground picking up the rocks. But the social aspect of it and thinking about the ways that, you know, volcanoes have influenced culture and how culture, you know, Im influences then the people that live around these areas. They're really important questions and areas for, for us to look into because it helps us better prepare, as you say, better prepare uh, local communities, the responders, as, as, us as geologists to respond to crises and disasters. Yeah, for sure. And it's important to understand things like the media, you know, the media's relationship with um, communication and with things like volcanic eruptions, disasters like um, volcanic eruptions. It's an interesting relationship. And um, me and Becky have been supervising a great master's research student over the last year called Elena, who's been working on kind of perceptions of volcanology and how that's affected by media articles mm. and how the press releases that are originally released by scientific organisations may be translated and kind of reinterpreted in media articles and the impact that that has on the reader um, because this is all how people behave um, during volcanic crisis is is really down to a whole complicated a whole complicated um, story yeah. of what makes us who we are and it's very difficult to unpick all those different things but we can we can look at some of those things um in individual ways and through focus groups and discussing with people and social and historical research we can start to understand those relationships a bit more and i mean we're not the only group who's worked on this there have mm. been great others um people like jenny barclay and anna hicks who have also worked in this area over the years, but it's something that for sure hasn't taken as front um, as front a place in volcanology as some of the more physical aspects um, over the last, you know, thirty years. Yeah, and are, are these efforts as well something that you have, you know, um, people coming in from the social sciences involved as well uh, to to give you those different perspectives and that expertise of, well, no, this is actually this is human behaviour. This is how you know, the public responds to, you know, uh, general media, tabloid media, social media, because all of those, they all have their different intricacies and complexities. And as you say, it, it's also a problem. It's a psychological um, problem. Well, as, as I say, no, problem is the wrong word, psychological uh, area to look into. Yeah. And to be honest, these linkages have been lacking for too long in volcanology and in many physical sciences. You know, we 
we all need to do better at reaching out beyond our silos and working with others in both within our departments and across departments. And actually, that's been a really nice thing of joining. So when my contract finished at the University of Hull, I joined Sheffield Hallam University, where I'm kind of embedded in a department that has environmental scientists, physical geographers, human geographers, mm. social environmental scientists, kind of working quite closely together on different modules. And it's been really eye opening to meet these people and see the different types of research they do and to think, well, actually, that would be really interesting to interplay with some of the physical understanding. And and I think that, yeah, it's always the case that people get siloed, but I think things are improving. I think more and more now people are looking beyond their own disciplines. And I think there's more funding bids and calls coming out that are encouraging that kind of interdisciplinarity. So yes. it's exciting, I think. Yeah, you, you see it just gradually changing in the job network, particularly in the last even one or two years. Positions that come up that are just, oh, wow, that's a really interesting combination of fields that they're looking for. And they're not looking for people to have, you know, ev everything on that list because not everybody, you know, stands completely equal on either side, <laughs> either side of the bridge, but it's people who might have in some insight or have worked in some area and oh. they're able to cross that bridge in some way. And it's about becoming more well-rounded, you know, and mm. and there are some people in more generally in geoscience who've done some really great work in advocating for geoscience, becoming more connected to society. So Ian Stewart has spoken about that for many years. Yeah. Joel Gill with Geology for Global Development, a big part of what that charity is about is showing how geoscience is really tied into the sustainable development goals, all of which are about people. You know, all of the sustainable development goals are about people and how they live. Um, and geoscientists are crucial to so many of those parts of life um, but for too long we've just stayed in our own little our own little zone and haven't haven't felt confident perhaps or haven't felt it necessary to you know kind of step out and make those connections with social geographers and social scientists and people like psychologists and planners yes yeah it's a really really good points you're making and i love the fact that you you brought up geology for global development because one you're a, a trustee for the charity is that right i am yeah. yes so not long after i joined the university of hull um i saw this advert come up for trustees and it's a charity i'd kind of noticed and kind of admired from afar for a good year probably before i had seen this advert come up and I thought, yeah, that's totally, totally where I need to be. And I think it was all part of me shifting mm. mentally from the oil industry. It was an industry that had given me a lot of skills and a lot of understanding of the world, a lot of awareness of society and its needs and its future. But it was all part of this kind of shift for me yeah. towards a more sustainable career and towards really applying my skills to things that I believed in so strongly. And, and, and this to, charity is one of those things. Uh, yeah, as you say, to then have that opportunity to directly be involved in a project um, and, and an organisation such as GFGD, um, being able to work towards those goals. And so as, as a role for a trust, trustee, is it about, you know, a, promotion of the charity, finding new in investment or ideas for projects? So really a trustee's role is oversight. Yeah. So the charity runs, it has a great team of staff who run the charity, all of whom are volunteers. And the trustee team is separate from that um, kind of executive team mm -hmm. and the, the kind of main charity team. And the trustee team meet maybe once a quarter and we hear what the charity has been up to and we provide oversight over the finances of the charity and over the activities. But because GFGD is a really nice charity um, and really inclusive of the trustees kind of experience, mm. you know, we've been invited to give um, ideas on strategy, strategy development. And it's been really it's been a really great thing to be able to be part of that journey of the charity as it grows. Um, it's developed quite a lot over the last year. Um, it's got a number of new volunteers who've come in who have injected so much energy into things. And it's been really nice to kind of be part of the, 
the trustee team overlooking that yes. process. Um, yeah. And we're a really diverse range of kind of backgrounds as well on the trustees, which is really good as well. Yeah, because it is the um, organisation has just celebrated its uh, tenth, tenth anniversary, right? This past um, yeah. October, September, not not long ago. Um, so I know that they were really trying to pr promote, you know, the projects that they've done and um, where they're planning to go in the future. And there's some fantastic work they've done over the years. I remember when I was um, at the University of Bristol as, as some years ago, they'd started up um, a project based on uh, looking at local uh, resilience in uh, Guatemala around volcanic hazards. And so it's look, it's, but you know, their focus isn't just on, you know, a project in volcanic hazards. There's um, community education, there's providing um, sort of, you know, water resources. There's such a variety of things that are involved with, within the charity. So I would really encourage anybody to to, to have a look at GFGD and um, their website's gfg.org. Org, sorry, so you can go straight straight there, have a look at the work they've done, uh, the projects in the past, and where they're hoping to uh, go in the future as well. And so it, it's really, really great to hear, you know, your perspective and how inclusive that they've been of your, you know, your background, your knowledge and others as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, they've just been involved with COP um, as an mm -hmm. observer. Um, and I think that that really shows, you know, their respect they, they you know there is respect for the charity and the international community and there's a growing understanding hopefully now that charities like gfgd that are really trying to promote the importance of geoscience and sustainable development that hopefully you know that voice is growing and that understanding is growing and that geoscientists moving forward will have an even more diverse range of jobs to go into and you know that society will understand that role ever more so that's the dream you know yes. that's the hope that and you know a main a main part of what gfg stands for is this idea of not leaving anyone behind and making sure that the global south in particular you know geoscience education is available and the sustainable development goals particularly in those areas that geoscience is really being utilised to help, to help um, really sustainably develop those countries. Yeah. And a huge part of that as well is bringing in th this range of voices from like, I, I, this kind of ties back, you know, to the, the group itself you were talking about before, which is actually called Voices and it's bringing in those different expertise. But when we're thinking about where geoscience is going in the future, it's being able to harness all those different backgrounds and expertise, not just in the scientific field, but in human experience as well. You know, we can't necessarily speak to the issues faced by those living in other countries, other, uh, other cultures. We have to work side by side alongside other organizations, the local communities to be able to address these problems. Yeah, and for a long time that hasn't happened. You know, geoscience is a really colonial subject. Um, for a long time, it was really a tool of colonialism. Its roots are kind of deeply embedded in the empire, particularly the geoscience that we see as the modern mm. taught Western discipline. Because, um, of course, bearing in mind that other geoscience knowledge is out there, it's just that the one that we're taught in universities in this country and in other countries is very embedded in this idea of inequity, basically. Um, and it's really permeated the discipline. And that's something that, you know, myself and collaborators have been working on recently is trying to unpick that, trying to unpick how that's influenced the discipline that we see today, how it's influenced the people who do geoscience and how it's influenced the, the sense of belonging that, people who feel othered, you know, um, people who are minoritized in geoscience feel. And it has some really serious issues, the subject, mm -hmm. the discipline, and, but it's, it's something that these issues are now at least being discussed. Because when I studied undergraduate earth science 20 years ago, these things weren't even no. on the table. No. People, the awareness wasn't even close to being there, which makes me sad. Um, but I do hope now that, you know, around the world, the world is changing, yeah. although it seems at times divisive, more divisive than ever. 
um, there are a lot more voices being heard. Yeah, we do. Um, we, we, know, we in our microcosm of, yeah, I hope that in our microcosm of geology, you know, we can we can shout loud and and make positive changes. Yeah, as, as you yeah. say, we can do that. Looking back at you know, okay, where were we two, five, ten, twenty years ago, and thinking about where we are now, and at a time when it it feels, as you say, you know, more problems are arising. We do have to focus on also focus on the progress that has been made, as you say, and to be able to recognise yeah. the areas that we have improved in and being able to bring projects like this and. That, um, cross-disciplinary action, uh, collaborative efforts. Um, so it's nice to hear that, you know, we're able to see more of these things in society. Because uh, another project that you work on is um, a group called Geoscience for the Future as well. I think that's a, a great time to bring this up. I think we're yeah, basically definitely. perfectly there with those words. <laughs> Segway. Yes. Ideal segue. Yeah, who knew? <laughs> Um, yeah, so Geoscience of the Future was really, it really started out as a place for me to vent my spleen <laughs> because after being in industry for a while, and it's tricky in industry because you represent your company, and I took that very seriously. You know, I represented my company. Um, it's difficult to speak completely truthfully from your own perspective because at the end of the day, you are being paid by a company and you are under that umbrella, kind of whether you like it or not, which is why it's so important to work for the right companies that mm. you really, you know, that you really believe in and that you really care about. Um, but for me personally, when I moved back to academia, me starting the website was really an opportunity just to hear new stories. I had become so sad that all I ever heard was how geoscience was awful and how the extractive industries were awful and how geoscientists were terrible people. And I was tired of it, really. Because um, I knew, I knew that geoscience was totally crucial to society and totally underpinned, whether people like it or not, totally underpins almost everything we do. Um, so really it was born in frustration, that <laughs> website. And kind of like, look guys, let's change this record. Um, let's talk positively about our subject let's find those positive stories let's find those different voices rather than the same voices all the time let's look under rocks let's listen to the young generation of geoscientists who are coming through what's their research what's driving them you know all these different ways that geoscience is crucial for sustainability let's hear about that let's not just keep on saying oh geoscience is crucial let's actually hear you know tangible yeah. stories of why it's important um, so really, it just started from sheer damn <laughs> frustration, Sam, I'm not going to lie. Um, but then I was joined by Hazel Beaumont, who is a force of nature, who was incredible at kind of keeping me grounded and not afraid to say, you know, that's ridiculous. Don't do it that way. Um, <laughs> and then just very recently, we've been joined by uh, Jen Roberts at Strathclyde, who, again, is just a fantastic um, collaborator on that initiative. Our WhatsApp feed is just full of images of our cats. Um, <laughs> and it really is, it's good for the soul yeah. to have collaborators like that who you can have very serious conversations about geoscience with and the future of geoscience and what we want for our subject. But then also just to share a lot of cat photos on WhatsApp. <laughs> well, why not? Um, <laughs> as you say, it's providing that positive spin as well and giving that light as well. Like when we were talking about voices before about the different um projects you're involved in whether it's media and the ways that people you know perceive things during um hazards and crisis it's but the other side of it is you know looking at um you know video games <laughs> in in yeah. science and um you know scientific art all those different things that are more grounded in more people's daily lives um that potentially can be a, an access point for them to understand oh Actually, I, I can now appreciate how geoscience and geology is an integral part of how I live and my society. Yeah. And I think that there are so many things to unpick and so many things to explore in that. You know, I think working with children and seeing mm -hmm. how children respond to different um, aspects of science um, and seeing how art and particularly children's books and illustrations influences how they think and how they feel is incredible. I mean, my kids have Jess Wade's book, Nano, 
And it's just yeah. so beautiful. I mean, they should just sell that as an adult book. That should not be a children's <laughs> book. Um, some of them should be for us. Um, but, you know, seeing books like that really, really drives home this power of art and science. You know, there's so many more engaging ways to tell stories. And I think that's something that still frustrates me on Geoscience of the Future. You know, none of us have much time. We're kind of hamstrung in a way by our own format. We'd like to be more creative and try different things, but time, time, time. It's always needing more time. Yeah. Well, but yeah, totally. I think science and art are finally starting to come together more in the mainstream. I think, mm. again, it's something that's probably always been there, but something that wasn't seen as kind of a mainstream um, option for many scientists. But now you go to the annual VMSG conference, so the Volcanic and Magmatic Studies Group Conference, and you see posters that are depicting art installations talking about volcanoes. So Jenny Barkley and her yeah. team do a lot in that kind of work on Montserrat. And you see people talking about storytelling in Guatemala, like Elsa's work. So there's just some really innovative stuff going on. I can't even own to doing any of it myself, yeah. <laughs> but I'm always in awe of people who are able to blend science and art so beautifully. But one of my favourite things is whenever I discover someone new as a science artist or as an artist who's, you know, been brought in to do science as part of, um, you know, an exchange programme. One of the ones I absolutely love is um, a programme called The Artist at Sea through the Schmidt Ocean, Ocean Institute. And they mm -hmm. bring someone on, purely as an artist to each of their expeditions. And the role of this person is to, you know, interpret the experience, the um, the samples they collect, the data they visualize. And at the end, they have a finished product and it could be anything from a song to an abstract um, piece of artwork, or even I think someone did, a, you know, turned the corals they'd seen on the seafloor into a metallic structure. So as you it's say, amazing, in the world it? of volcanology, we've got we've got an incredibly visual. The possibilities subject. are endless. Yeah. I remember my favorite workshop that I've ever been on was one um, in 2020 in January. Um, Ian Stewart and Jenny Barkley ran a workshop around storytelling um, in hazards and volcanoes. And this whole workshop, it was pretty packed. There must have been 30 people and we we're all in small groups and we were all just coming up with stories ways to communicate stories to different age groups about volcanoes and it was just so nice to see all these people who the day before had been standing in front of very scientific posters all kind of working together to come up with these crazy stories <laughs> some of which had nice illustrations like quick little cartoons that were drawn with them and you know the potential there yeah. to actually work with artists as well yeah it's it's amazing and it's something that me and some of my collaborators would definitely like to do more of, and particularly through the Voices group. Um, but just, you know, watch this space. One day Fantastic. we'll have the time and the money to do it. Yes. As, as you say, it's, we are, we're in a world where we're starting to push more towards those kinds of funding, where these things can be recognised as, you know, actual valued scientific efforts and not necessarily through collecting scientific data. Sure. So, on, and on the subject of storytelling, um, I think this will be a perfect place to jump into uh, asking you for a story, <laughs> um, something memorable that's happened to you in your life related to volcanoes, geology in general, anything. Um, yeah, my, my volcano story is um, when I was doing my undergraduate mapping and I you know, grew up in Cornwall um, I had never been on a holiday abroad until I was 19. Um, and for my undergraduate mapping, me and one of my friends saved up money and we decided we were going to go to Santorini and map the Santorini parts of Santorini. And luckily back then we didn't need field assistance. That was, that was a thing. <laughs> that was a thing that didn't happen. Um, so we were able to go out, this, these two young women were able to go out to Santorini and spend six weeks on different parts of the island together. Not a bad way and, to do your mapping. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. And uh, and I just remember every day the awe, the sheer awe of waking up in that place and almost it feeling spiritual, the level of intensity of that scenery. And I've always been one to kind of wax lyrical about scenery and get really kind of abs absorbed in it. But Santorini is pretty special. And 
one day we we weren't we weren't very well off on this trip you know we were really scrimping and we went for days when all we would eat was like a one euro eros for our tea and that was you know that would be dinner this one euro eros um but we saved up and we did one of the volcano tours out to the middle of the island and i remember we stood on the rocks in the center on the akamini and and just realizing that this was like the youngest rock I had ever stood on, and it was, I think it would have been about 50 years old. And those mm. uh, people are going to be emailing you in saying she doesn't know her Santa Maria geology. I think it was about <laughs> 50 years old, the last eruption there. And um, I remember us both just standing on this rock and just looking around us. You know, you're stood in the middle, yeah, and you look around the caldera surrounding you. You can, and it you, was just, you can literally it was just, just turn on the spot, can't you? Full 360 yeah, it panorama. Was just, it was just an immense experience. and really something that's tied me and that friend together for a really long time actually um and then you know i was hooked you know yeah. that was my first experience of ever visiting an active volcano and after that that really solidified in me this desire to understand these these beasts and how they worked and their unpredictable nature um but for sure my research interests have changed since that point and my I've changed so much since that 19 year old stood on that rock, but it was pretty, it was pretty definitive in terms of, um, yeah, giving me a sense of what I wanted to do with my life. And have you been back and stood on that rock? No, no, but, but just before COVID hit, I did get some research funding to do a project on Santorini. Fantastic. And I was so delighted at the prospect of going back and then COVID hit. So I'm very, I'm very fortunate, you know, touch wood, you know, I've been, me and my family have been safe during COVID, so I can't complain, but it's a shame that I haven't been back to Santorini yet. So hopefully, Sam, it next will, year, hopefully it will I'll be get soon. to use that money. <laughs> well, that's the dream. Well, wonderful. I, I hope you get back to stand on that rock. Um, me too. So thank you so much for joining us today, Natasha. It's been a really, really um, interesting conversation to hear your, you know, insights into so many different areas of geoscience and research and industry and science communication you've really done some fantastic um work, work over the years that and i know a lot of people are very very grateful um for, for the value that you've added um into our field um it's, so yeah it's all because of the collaborators i've yes. worked with some really amazing <laughs> amazing supportive people so i'm very very grateful for that that's the best thing about geoscience it's all the all the people who you can gather around you and form new groups Brilliant. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll wrap it up there. So everything we've talked about today, you know, we'll, we'll provide links, and um, so you can check out Natasha's work and the things we've discussed with Voices, Geoscience for the Future, Geology for Global Development, um, and you can just, you know, see for yourselves where hopefully we hope to take geoscience in the future. So thank you so much for joining us, Natasha. Thanks, Sam. Thanks. <laughs>